I wanted to visit with you a little bit today about steelage. We've seen a huge increase in bourbon production in the state in the last decade. Uh, a lot of that increase in production has come from a couple things. One is, is just expansion of our larger distilleries that have been here, like uh, Jim Beam and Wild Turkey and those. But then also, just like uh, Bart and I were talking about with the craft brewers, there's been a lot of craft distilleries that have kind of popped up over the last decade. And so those are the ones that we're seeing also increased availability of, of what we would refer to as whole steelage. And I've got a, a sample of whole steelage here. And, and what you'll see when I pass this around is there's a lot of water in this whole steelage. It runs about 93% water, so about 7% solids or grain and you can see the grain that has settled out here in, in the stillage right here. But you're dealing with a very wet product and so shipping or transportation becomes an issue because with three dollars, three dollars and fifty cent a gallon diesel you really can't afford to haul this stuff very far. So it's a really a localized kind of a feed stuff. Nutritional wise it's going to be very similar, nearly exactly the same as our dry distiller's grains because this is the source of origin for our dry distiller's grains. It's just got a lot of water in it. So it's high in protein, we'll run 25 to 28 percent protein, and it's got a decent amount of energy. It'll be somewhere in the, the upper 90s on TDN, so it can be both a protein and an energy source. As you look at that and you see those grains settling out, that should cue you a little bit. If I'm going to store that on the farm for any given time, I probably need a recirculation pump. Because what will happen is those grains will get compressed and they'll clog up your valve if you don't keep it recirculating and getting that grain to mix back in. And so you need to be thinking about that. And that becomes a bit of a hassle and a challenge because I've got to get electric to that pump and those types of things. And every morning I got to run a few hundred gallons through there to recirculate it and get that grain back in suspension before I pull out to go feed it. A lot of our farmers are taking and feeding every day, so they're a larger operation. They may be bringing in a tractor trailer load every day and, and feeding the tractor trailer load every day, and that doesn't really become an issue. It's only when you're going to store it. I try to encourage people to only bring in as much as you can feed because it is an industrial waste with a conditional feed use. And once you decide to do something else with it, like put it in a, in a manure pit or land apply it, it reverts back to an industrial waste. And then you need special permitting and, and those things to do that. So if you're going to feed it, use it as a feed and, and leave it at that. Some of our smaller craft distilleries, that's the way they're getting rid of it because they haven't maybe sold any bourbon yet because it's going to take, what, five to seven years before they can sell that first uh, bottle of bourbon out of there. So they're not maybe as cash um, heavy to be able to invest in some kind of dewatering technology. Our other distillers maybe are investing in, in a dewatering technology like a centrifuge. Think about your clothes washer. And when you hit that spin cycle, it spins and gets that water to come out. And so what's left in where the clothes would be is the spent grains. So we would refer to this as wet distiller's grains or kind of the slang term would be wet cake. And so that's basically all the grains that settled out in the bottom is, is there now. And then the liquid that gets out is going to go into a series of evaporators and that evaporation then drives some of the moisture off. We said the stillage has about 7% dry matter, 93% water. Typically, the wet grains like that's going to be about 70 to 75 percent water, 25, 30 percent dry matter. Okay, so we're getting some of that water out, being able to transport it a little bit further, a little easier to handle. You can scoop it up with your tractor loader or those things and feed it that way or mix it into TMR. Once it goes, that liquid fraction goes through the evaporator, we get what's called condensed solubles, um, condensed distiller solubles, or the slang term for it is syrup. And so you can see that it becomes kind of a, a thick pudding, maybe a, not a thick pudding, but a runny pudding, but it's thicker than that stillage that we passed around. It has a lot of fat in it, okay, because the fat tends to separate out and, and go with that. It can be in the 10 to 15 percent fat range, and so it is high in energy. It's also going to run in the upper teens on protein, somewhere between 16 to 20 on crude protein, 
Not as high as the, the wet cake and the uh, stillage that we passed around, but still a decent protein source. So it can be used both as an energy and protein supplement as well. Um, those two, the last uh, one that were passed around, the syrup and the wet cake, can then be recombined and put into a drum dryer, and that's where we would get our dried distiller's grains with solubles. And so the one thing I wanted to point out with you on this example is you notice how yellow, kind of light tan those are, but notice how dark these dried distiller's grains are. When we run those into a drum dryer and we're not careful on watching the temperature and the duration of time that they're in that drum dryer, because of that barley husk that's in there, they can burn pretty quick. And that goes through that Maillard reaction or that, that browning reaction that we see when we put our toast in the toaster. And that can bind up some of the free starch and protein and reduce the feeding value of that distiller's grains. It would be nice if that color was a little bit lighter brown and, and that would improve the feed value just a little bit. But if you get some that's like that, it's probably going to be a little bit lower in energy value and protein. If it gets to the point that it smells burnt, there can be some palatability issues. We've seen that with corn gluten feed as well. Cattle just will not eat feed that has that burnt taste to it. So just be kind of watching those things uh, when we get into the dry distiller's grains. Now, the other thing I wanted to share with you, if you've not seen it, is, is our basic just corn gluten soy hull blend. Um, that's still a, a good viable product, but watch the soy hull price right now. It has not really come back down. There's discussion that soy hulls could be coming down here um, as the soybean crop starts rolling in and we start crushing more. But there may be a little bit higher price than, than what they probably uh, will be in about a month. But just keep an eye on what that soy hull price does and, and uh, see if it starts ticking down for you as we go into the winter. These last two are maybe a little bit less common, but as grain prices get high, one of the common things we'll see is, is feed stuffs that are less common coming out of the southern states where we grow cotton and where we grow more rice. And so some of those feedstuffs are, are good in value, they're good nutritional, but then there's also some byproducts that can come out of that processing industry that are not as good from a nutritional value. The other night we were talking on the uh, webinar about cottonseed hulls. It's a great way to incorporate roughage into some self-fed rations. Uh, when, when we go back and we look at some of the receiving research that's been done with them, they seem to stimulate intake on these newly received feeder calves, probably because of the small particle size. It can wash out of the rumen pretty quick, and that might be the main reason why they increase uh, palatability um, and intake, but they don't really smell that good, and they're kind of dusty, and so I really think it's due to a particle size and washing out of that rumen pretty quick. We bought some of these because a lot of, a lot of your small elevators are only gonna get these in 40-pound bags. We bought some of these for the, the heifers down here to make some starter rations for beef production class. And um, at our local elevator here, they cost us $480 a ton. Now the feed value, nutrition-wise, probably places it around $60 a ton. But it's got to come all the way from the south. It's got to be bagged. There's going to get bags that get broke at the feed mill and that, and so they got to build the price in for all that shrinkage loss and everything. But that's an example of one you want to be careful on. You know, your fescue hay is better quality than what that feed stuff is right there, and I guarantee nobody's selling it for 400 a ton. Okay? So just be kind of penny-wise, dollar smart when it comes to some of these alternative feeds. I've got another one that comes out of the south. This is what we call rice mill feed. It is a blend of 50, about 50% 50 blend of rice hulls and rice bran. Rice bran is a really good feed, very similar to quality of soybean hulls. Runs about 12 to 14 on protein. The TDN is right up there with soy hulls and corn gluten feed. But then they blend in the rice hulls, which honestly have no feed value at all but they've got to move some of that stuff. We use it in poultry houses as bedding. It's been used in some dairy houses as bedding. A lot of times it's used as a carrier for some of our vitamin 
vitamin A, D, E as a, as a carrier for those. But it has almost no feed value. And so to add value to the rice hulls, we blend it in with a good feed rice brand just to market it. As corn gets up five, six dollars a ton and you say, I don't want to pay that for feed, then these feedstuffs begin making their way into your feeds. And they oftentimes maybe aren't the best value um, because of the nutritional quality of it. If it was rice bran, you know, no problem. The other thing is to think about is it's very small on a particle size, very dusty. And so newly received cattle, we don't like a lot of dust in feed. When we're weaning calves, we don't like a lot of dust in feed. So now you got to think about what we're going to do to try and control the dust. Add molasses, add some oil, something like that. So I just bring that up because that's another one of those just to be cautious of and, and kind of watch. Um, also, if you're carrying five gallon buckets and you go throw a bunch of that out there on a windy day, where's it going to go? Whoosh. So you're just throwing money away. So, so just kind of be thinking about some of those things as well. I gave you another sheet that's got some lines that go this way. And I wanted to just briefly give you a, kind of an update on some of the investments that we've made here on the farm. Uh, he's probably got them right there. Let me grab one of these sheets. I just need one of them. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. I'll take those. So on here, there's five different rows of numbers. Each of those goes back to a bull. <clears throat> Down here in these paddocks, we put in these, um, they're called sea lock feeders. And they will measure individual intakes based off of a RFID tag. And every time that calf or that bull puts its head in the feed bunk, takes a reading of the scale, and then it begins recording weight while that calf is in there and it looks at the disappearance of feed or the change in the, in the scales. And that allows us then to go back and get individual intakes. <laughs> We're just feeding a little bit of distiller's grain to those bulls down there to supplement those grass traps. But I want you to look at the second to the last column of numbers under total. That first bull ate 1.7 pounds over that uh, time frame from, from October 1 to October the 11th. The next bull 8.3, the next bull 7.2, the next bull 9.3, and the last one 0 0.03. See the variation in what bulls are using those feeders? So this is also kind of that basic technology when, when RFI, residual feed intake, was really hot about a decade ago. This was also kind of the technology that was being used to be able to look at residual feed intake on some of your genetics that were out there. There's some, some bull studs and that that were, were using RFI and, and getting these feed uh, kind of intake numbers to go back and calculate residual feed intake. Um, Dr. McLeod and Dr. Harmon and I, we, we have opportunities then to use these maybe in pasture settings because they're solar based. So look at maybe opportunities on feed stuff. Is there a difference in, in intake, palatability of some feed stuffs? Um, we have maybe the opportunity to look at uh, mineral supplementation and is there some things that make mineral less palatable, more palatable. One bunk will support about 10 to 12 head. And, and so uh, depending on what we're wanting to do, um, we'll be able to kind of look at some of that data. We've used the, those to write two USDA grants. Unfortunately, they've not been successful. Um, but you kind of got to think about it. You know, if they build it, they will come. So hopefully, if we've got some of the opportunities to, to feed some of those cattle and collect some data, maybe we can get some funding then to, to uh, support some more research. And then I want to talk to you a little bit more of an applied type of technology. Dr. Jackson's going to talk to you about some technology over there. Um, this begins to kind of incorporate some of the things that he's going to talk to you about. We look at drones and being on that front end. With off the farm and you know, jobs and labor being limited, hauling buckets out every day can get a bit challenging and, and our availability gets to be a bit challenging. Too many things going on here. Thank you. So we were, we were looking at thinking about how can we maybe use some technology that's out there to be able to supplement cows a little bit more accurately, pinpoint our opportunity to do strategic supplementation. There are other tools out there 
you got self-fed blocks and some of those uh, tubs. You got lick wheels from molasses type products. But when it comes to some of our commodity feeds, it gets a little bit more challenging. So this feeder uses a solar panel on the top and then it uses a series of timers. And so you can program this feeder to drop feed up to seven times a day and it will basically open the bottom up for whatever given period of time. You need to calibrate how much feed is dropped per second because it's going to be different for some of our commodity blends. But once you figure out how much you want to supplement, you program the time and the frequency and so then it will just drop that feed. It's got a backup beeper on it. Many of you probably know you go in the field and you beep that horn and the cows come running because they think they're going to get some feed. So the cows cue into the backup beeper here. When they hear it, then they start coming up to the feeder. It's also got sprayers. This tank here is a sprayer. It's got six nozzles here on the side that you can then set a timer for. Maybe give it a minute, minute and a half delay so the cattle get up there and then it will spray your fly spray on the cattle that are standing around the feed bump. So if you want, I'll show you here real quick kind of what happens. When you program it and it gets, gets ready to drop, and that's basically what it does, okay? What was that, about a second, two seconds? So you can program it to do that up to seven times in a day. Heifer development, cow supplementation, Maybe if we get in a situation where we're trying to finish some cattle out on pasture and we need some grain supplement to go with it, this might be another option for us when we've got labor limitations and we can't get there every day. So I just wanted to kind of share this with you. We're going to try to use this through the winter on some of the heifers and see how it holds up and uh, see what the cost effective effectiveness is on this. Uh, we've actually, I wrote a grant in on this as well to try and see if we could get some funding for that because it's very applied and it fits our small family farms as a way to offset some of our supplementation strategies. Any questions? Yeah, so when, when I priced this and, and got this one in, this comes out of Arkansas. They've got different sizes. They can be smaller or big. Actually, this is the smallest one. They come in bigger than this. This one right here was about eight grand. That's what this one cost. Life expectancy on it, I don't know, but the actuators on the back side, you all can go over and look. Those electric actuators are pretty cheap, probably less than 50 bucks each. Solar panel on top is a small one. It's got a real small battery in it, pretty cheap. Josh probably can tell us component costs on it, but it's not that expensive, okay? Now, the reason I say I don't really know today is because I got a friend that works in the door manufacturing he said the steel markup right now is a 45% surcharge on steel. So given that it's a poly container, helps reduce that cost, but you still got this steel base. Good question. Anything else? Um, what is the volume on this one? Let me see if I... <coughs> So this one is 103 cubic feet, and the biggest one they make is a 300 cubic foot one. So uh, this one probably will hold what? Mm, close to two ton, somewhere in that ballpark. There's, a, there's doors on the back side. There's, see, these, see these hinges? These doors just flip up. And so you just bring your auger in, come in on your auger truck. Or if you had some young youngins, you could just have them lift your bags up in. But it's going to come in mostly in an auger. Good question. Anything else? All right, that's all I really have for you today. Thanks for coming out and visiting with us today.